Makes sense. YouTube's recording a lot. Any quotes from it left? Like, he'll still know from New York Times. Yeah, I'll connect to the speaker. Or we post articles. Look at the New York Times. Even the uh, fake news New York Times said this. Wi Fi isn't set up on your tap. For help, go to the Alexa app. Bluetooth pairing mode is off. Share Come and start sharing. I wanna be as free as the spirit of those who laugh. I'm talking about the rules and my man who sat left on conception. The rest the resurrection for all who steps in that direction. The way the tone is hard is where the fight way. And everything a nigga do may not be what he might say. Chicago nights day. Stay on the line, but I might be the last day. Week 28? <laughs> I don't know, the episode didn't exist though. <laughs> so I think we're still on episode 27. Yeah, I'm gonna learn What? It has like the. You guys have like Mighty Caps on right now. Oh, you hit the, you hit the joint. Oh, you got filters on it. That happened once before, yeah. It's like, yo. You gotta oh, take the filter though. We're good. Oh, yeah. Last time B-Way had those glasses on. Like, <laughs> A little good too. Three. 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 I'm not going, I'm not, I'm not going through your phone. Oh, Here we go. Opinionated facts, week 28. I just need to, yeah. Let's get Common going, man. Is it Common? It's Common one, not J. Cole. Common. You know J. Cole's is better. B, is B one of the best albums ever? No, but it's a classic album. Don't get crazy. <laughs> Don't get crazy, buddy. Go to the extreme on every day. Uh, okay. well, B was nice album. Yeah, it's it's the greatest album ever. I said one of them. I said one of them. See, y'all didn't say the greatest. It's like one of them. It's a great album. Oh, Dangerously in Love, Beyonce, is one of the greatest <laughs> albums ever. <laughs> yeah, we heard this last night. Okay, Grown it. men, listen to it when they go to sleep. He's giving you a chance to talk to you without being interrupted. He's about to come in and oh. I was trying you. <laughs> 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 here we go, here we go. Microphone check, microphone check. Hey, this is the world's most popular barbecue talk, barbershop talk, man cave conversation. However you like it or dislike it, this is the heavyweight champ of sports talk podcast. This is your opinion made of facts. These are your hosts. To my far right, I'm going to uh, give him his name back today because I think like with my, I, I, I offended my political connects last week. Sure did. So I'm, I'm gonna stop. Uh, I'm gonna stop giving him the Donald Trump name, and we're gonna call him his regular, his government name. We got Brandon Rudolph to the far <laughs> right. Mr. Rez in the building with us. You. To his left, we have S. Dot Rudolph back for another week with us. We appreciate the appearance. To his left, we have special guests. Future Hall of Fame coach, <laughs> uh, Coach Dr. Todd Milley, head football coach at Lancaster Catholic, also the author of six books, also a teacher at uh, in the Penn Manor School District, uh, 20 something years teaching total. Uh, I've coached for 20. This is uh, 17 or 18 teaching. Teaching for 17 years, coaching for 20 years. And also is a professor at Dickinson, right. Dickinson University. So we appreciate you stopping by, Coach. Uh, we have Dixon on the boards. Yep. Uh, host, <laughs> host of Kings Court. Yeah, yeah. Every uh, Thursday. What's that? Thursday at six thirty. Thursday at six thirty, Kings Court. So You'll probably the... start on time too. Yeah, we do. <laughs> Tune in this week. Tune in this week. We're gonna talk about why women can't keep a man. Whoa. Oh, man. <laughs> I was like, whoa. Man, that's already <laughs> the headlines will get you in trouble. <laughs> yeah. Hey, yeah. so how was everybody's week, man? Red, how was your week? My week was my week was okay, man. Nothing nothing special. A lot of talk about our twenty seventh episode that doesn't <laughs> exist. 
But we won't talk about it. We're going to call that the black episode. Let's talk about <laughs> it. <laughs> we can talk about it. No, we can talk no, about it. No, man. I don't want to offend your historical connects. Tomorrow, how was your week, man? Good week, man. First week of no basketball season. You know what I mean? You can't open up that every time. Last you week was like, oh, UNC first week won? That's, that's a great week. Put out B-Way's fires. <laughs> then I worked a 38 hour shift. Just got off Saturday morning, so I didn't do much. You were like throwing like knives last night or something. Oh, yeah, hatchets. Hatchets? Yeah, I forgot you about that. You weren't very good at it either. What? You wouldn't even get one on the board. Yeah, I seen, you know, it was like different takes. She's probably like three or four takes. All first was like, oh, Everybody nah, go you back. you see of me was first he take. Was deleting, he was deleting. I swear on my brother's life. Whoa. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> they were on first takes, though. Once you get it down, you got it. Where'd you get that idea from? I read, my brother. No, Lancaster <laughs> Online. <laughs> I saw an article on Lancaster Online when they opened up. So you read? I read, yeah. yeah. Uh, where's the real that? news? Where's too? That? Real, <laughs> real news. news. Where's the that? You wanna, you wanna, you wanna give them a shout out or no? I will give them a shout out because they're reasonably priced for the fact that you can bring your own, you know, adult beverages and they, they give you ice for it. So it's a nice little. And you can gathering. throw knives. Hatchets. Yeah, it sounds Hatchets. dangerous. No, they got rules, but it's on Grain and Run next to like Bounce Craze. Oh yeah, okay. Newly oh, open, only yeah, open for yeah. four weeks now. So so, support, support local business, man. It's uh, it's not like the city. What is that? Township. That would be Mayhem Township. Mayhem Township. Township. All right, what's the name of it? Stump, Stumpies. Stumpies. Make sure you get out and support Stumpies. You know what I'm Stumpies? Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Stumpies. Yeah. Hatchery. Go throw some knives. <laughs> 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 uh, Coach, how's your all season going? After going 10 0 last season, uh, well, no, well, regular season 10 0, finishing 11 and 1. How's the all season going? First, thanks for having me here. And I want to tell your viewers that to, it's a shame they don't get the, the prelude to this because you already did a podcast before you said <laughs> That's how the podcast started. Right? <laughs> yeah, we used to have one. All the time we're having a podcast. Yeah, I sat like here that. for 15, 20 minutes before we started, and you guys are going at one another. Um, <laughs> uh, but I, I have coached everyone in a room, so I do appreciate uh, being back here. Um, you asked me how the all season's going? Yes. Uh, as smooth as we can make it. There is no all season town, Coach. Well, you know what Garnett said. Yeah, you know, they have a they have they have a month and a half off from the end of the season through the new year, uh, and then we get at it early January. But um, uh, you know we have half the team plays winter sports, and then as of the last two three weeks, we've had days off school because of snow. So we're we're making the most of what we got. The snow is hindering a lot. The weather here in the, in, in the Northeast been bad. Um, we also say. Yeah, like Samar, I, I I had a really good week, particularly Wednesday night. <laughs> oh, yeah, baby, um, UNC, did, UNC. Right? <laughs> well, let's get to it. Let's get to it, you know. Uh, we got to tell that story. I ran into you down in the Dean Dome. That's right. That was crazy. Uh, <laughs> I was like, Coach. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we have a picture. Yeah, we do have a picture. Yeah, I have it on my phone. Standing up on, on the, the hill there yeah. Yeah, as you enter the Dean Dome. We visited the Dean Dome this past summer, uh, me and my wife and my kids. Not to my... She's a North Carolina fan, so I want to be, uh, I want to be fair, fair, I guess. You're right, but it was definitely not Cameron. Yeah, much so, bigger. To revisit that game on Wednesday, uh, real quick analysis on it. Yeah, we're just not to be quick. Yeah, because Zion blows out his shoe, freakish accident, which which never really happens, and. He twists his knee and, and he gets hurt 30 seconds into the game. Now, you're shell shocked when you lose the number one player in the country. Jesus. Well, how? How's that an excuse? That's the fact. That the happened. Worst thing that happened to us in that game is that Zion got hurt because we were going to win the game regardless. <laughs> Senior leadership, Cam Johnson, Luke May, you see they showed up. They know the robbery. <clears throat> it's, uh, I was disappointed that you were that Zion got hurt. <clears throat> we wanted to beat you at full strength. Yes. I mean, everybody wants to win at full strength. You can't. Well, we were going to beat you. Well, that's my question to you guys. Do you respect the win? Absolutely. A win is a win. What are you talking about? You know how hard it is to get wins? <laughs> how... We beat Duke during years we had nobody. When we were only went, we didn't go to the tournament, we beat Duke that year. It's hard to get Duke Carolina wins. So, I don't know my role here. Can you speak freely, <laughs> Coach? Am I allowed? Am I allowed? Yeah. 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 You want to say you cut right. anybody off? What do? Duke has on the team, what, six? Five or six McDonald's McDonald's All Americans. Mm -hmm. I think it's five, right? It's five. Five. Yeah. So they lost one. They still have four. <laughs> so maybe that wasn't enough. Great point. I mean, you need a lot to be at UNC. But, no. so, but you had the, three of the top five recruits. The, the injury itself, sure. Uh, who knows how that game would have ended if Zion played the entire game? 
But you give Carolina credit. I mean, Luke May played all but 90 seconds of that game. Did you know that? 32 points. I didn't know he played that long. He played all but 90 seconds of that game. He took him out right before the four-minute break at the first half for a minute and a half, and then he put him right back in. Um, they play defense, which is something they normally don't do. Cam but Johnson. The last couple games they've been defending. Um, and in spite of not hitting shots from the outside, like Duke couldn't. We were 0 for our first 13 from three. I'm just saying, give well, Carolina some credit. Duke was like 2 for 14, too. Well, you made 2 you more played. than us. Yeah. <laughs> all right. To your benefit. Carolina, yes, they played well. Well, May and, and the camera kid played Cam well. Cam Johnson. Cam Johnson. They only it scored really close points. Man. They had 60, 64 points. It wasn't points like it was a close game. But listen, like I, mean, I said, if we, would have, if we would have went into this game knowing that we wasn't going to have Zion, then, yeah, I, I think we would have played better. But and Barrett still had 30, I guess, on, on that Wednesday night. The shock of him not – of of, of of him getting hurt played a big impact, when, especially when you have – you know, the president there, Floyd Mayweather. You got stars at the game. Tickets are going for Super Bowl prices. That's a regular dude game. And you get... People are always in the crowd. Yeah, well, we respect the program. That's what we do. Don't get, well, they, well, 44 was there for Carolina, just so you know. How great <laughs> How great was Obama's job? That's true. 44 was there for... What, 44 fans? No, 44. number 44. President. No. Other than Obama. He's a Carolina <laughs> fan. No, he like, he, he's, he's a like, Carolina he, fan. He supports both schools. When he filled his bracket out, every year he picked UNC. <laughs> he supports both schools. And he campaigned. Yeah. And Carolina he plays basketball in Carolina. Carolina. He has never once been to the Dean Dome. He's been to your practice, but he never once came to a game. Oh, my God. 44 was looking good in the jacket, though. With the 44 on the sleeve, like, I, I loved it. But. No, we're not giving him a Carolina fan. I'm He's not. a UNC guy. Him I want to hear him say it. Tight. I want to hear him say it. Does Zion ever play again for Duke? Um, uh, was he hit this? Zion will be here. We're already here now. Here. Zion will be there as soon as he's able to play. Definitely by the tournament. Marquise Lofton said he needs to sit out like Joey Bosa from now on. No. Or ask Melo how that NCAA chip is. Some kids like to compete, man. It's old fashioned mentality, but just compete. I think he finishes the season. He goes there to compete. He wanted to play in the biggest games. But go ahead. He also said, Millie, LCHS <laughs> is finest. Hashtag that purple and gold. <laughs> um, Duke, the, the 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 Duke fan in me wants him wants me to wants him to play again, but I don't know if it's if it's smart. Like, Who's yeah, you want you want to win a national title. Besides maybe a blown but Achilles, he comes out tomorrow. He gets a six uh, six figure shoe contract, no matter what. Without playing. If he again. even got hurt, he still gets that contract as soon as he's eligible. Yeah, I don't, I don't Do want them Nikes. Ever. What? Do you want them Nikes, though? I don't care. What do you wear? You want the money. <laughs> you talking about a $100 million shoe contract. I'll wear Puma. I'll wear... You going to blow out? Blow out, twist your knee? <laughs> yeah. Hey, you're right. For the right. For the right price. I don't know, though. I'm... Like, I'm... If I'm... If, I'm, if that's my son, yeah, we're going to... We're going to... We're going to think this thing through. No. Stop it. What are you going to do? You, you want your son to compete? If my son really wanted to compete, yes. But, like, as an advisor, you almost have to tell him, like, yo... Yeah, I'm saying, what calls? When I see Zion that, play, he, he likes to compete. He loves the game. Yeah. He's not one of those guys out there doing it for the fame. Another thing that helps is that we're like we're number one team in the country until tomorrow so, when the rankings come out. But we'll still, we'll still have a number one seed. Duke will. I shouldn't say where on no. on the podcast, <laughs> but. <laughs> Uh, that like hinders the decision too, because when you're that good, like if, if his team was you know UNLV or something, then yes, I wouldn't, I definitely wouldn't would would, would tell him not to play. Like, you're not coming back to a team that is not going to do anything. But since you're playing for one of the best teams in the country, you almost want you almost want to come back and get that get that shot. Like wouldn't you? That's what you play for. So it, it's tough. I respect any any any, any way they want to go. We're not looking at you either way, Zion. If you don't come back and you're and you're, I am. I think he's got to finish the season. And if you don't, you're going to judge him. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> I don't know if I take him number one, take RJ instead. <laughs> <laughs> he's got to finish the season, man. Get out Can't of here, go out man. like that. <laughs> you got to want a guy that's going to compete. I think if he's healthy, 100. percent You play. If you're not healthy, you don't go out there and risk it. Oh yeah, if he's healthy, yes. If he's not, if he's like 65, 70 percent, 30 percent, no, no. You think but, if he's 100%, how you got to go out? As a coach, play. you want him to play. Number one seed? If, 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 if you're Coach K, what are you telling him? It's the kid's decision. It's the kid and his family's decision. That's a good answer. Um, <laughs> yeah, very good. Now, look, let, so let me, let, me, yeah, let me step away as a fan here and try to be 
been advised of. Yeah, this is kind of arbiter here. Um, <clears throat> he's locked into playing the year as everyone has been since what 2005 because of what the NBA policy yeah. is. One year. What right. About, you can go play somewhere else right. for a year. Yeah, I guess you can. Um, a couple guys went across seas. But I, I just, I, just like the, the culture of everything today is so much different than what it was when you were younger. Mm -hmm. um, you know, high, we can't measure our experiences in, in playing high school and coaching high school to college really because coaches have reached a point where they're making millions and millions of dollars, you know, coaching contracts off the performance of their players mm -hmm. and their players get nothing for it. Um, uh, so I could see why even a Coach K might tell him, look, you have a, a shot, you know, you, you jump and land the wrong way, you can do further damage to your knee. Mm -hmm. So you might, you and your family might choose to make the decision to, to call quits here. But I don't think that's what he wants to do. You, if you watch him on, on, a, on the sideline of the, their game against Syracuse yesterday, I mean, he was, he was into it. Yeah. So I, I, don't, I don't think it's gonna come down to this. I just, as an impartial person here, <laughs> stepping away as a fan, I don't blame him, and I'm not going to criticize him if he does. I, I you know, I, you see this with with football all the time too, with college football. football um, I understand the risk; it's more of a risk. I thought that <laughs> risk is a risk. You know, you, you play yeah. sports, you take a risk that you, you can get hurt, and you know, but there, there's no there's no insurance on these kids and, and their careers. Well, he got the positive. They, he says ten million. He does. Yeah, ten million. I think it's like ten million, but that's that's jump change compared to what he'll make if he don't get hurt. Yeah, I mean that's still still a lot of money. Yeah. <laughs> um, Marquis said, said it also shows how top heavy and fragile Duke is. <laughs> <laughs> I got a question on this topic while we're on it. Because Duke has a contract that every player that plays for Duke must wear Nikes since the, or since the 90s, I think. Now, if you're a player that's not being paid, no compensation, should he be forced to wear Nike next time he plays? They're saying he has to by contract. When I played at Penn State, this is. A little separate but the player got like every time you suit up and I don't know if it still happens or I don't know if it happens at Duke with basketball but every game when we suit up in Nike gear we got like a 35 40 dollar stipend so he's getting paid <laughs> so I mean it's not much like we but say he wanted to wear a Reebok or Adidas should he have to wear Nikes how do you tell a player you have to wear this to play for my team we're not giving you no compensation, no contract. What's the penalty? I don't know what the penalty is. I don't know. I guess Duke like University would have man. to pay it. I would yeah. It would be a Duke thing. <laughs> For what Coach K makes, he can pay it. <laughs> that's right. But that's probably an NCAA violation. I know, I know. I know. <laughs> I know. Uh, <laughs> you can't find it because it ain't on the contract. Well, see, that goes into the part of the problem, I think, with, with NCAA because but you have a president of the NCAA that makes over – Emirates. Yeah, Mark Emmer, who makes yeah. over $2 million. I think it's more than that, isn't it? I think it's something like 2.5, 2.4. Yeah. You know, and then something like 19 VPs that make six figures a year. And, you know, all that's coming from what these athletes are producing for them. Yes. Um, and with these high revenue sports, football, basketball. You know, so that I, I always consider all those things when I'm talking about the future, you know, with these kids. I'm having a conversation with you on the podcast. I've had the conversation with my dad, too. Mm -hmm. um, when Saquon only played half of the downs in the bowl game two yeah. years ago, you know, so he took a position much like you. He's he's suited up. He should be playing every game or every play. And I'm just trying to put myself in him and his family's position, saying, well, they could lose out a lot here if something happens to him. Yeah. Well, I just can't. Saquon might not want to go play. Game. I just don't understand that. Like, if you want there to do it, I mean, but how many times is that have we ever seen that really happen? Someone's shoe blowing up like that. I mean. Nike shares, what they dropped, what, 1.1? You can't look at the shoes. Like, all the crazy. Injury. I think it was like overblown. Look I at mean, the Willis McGee. How many times are you ever really going to see that? Like, I don't, I don't expect his shoe to blow up next time he's out there on the court. We're saying injuries, period, though. Yeah, the injuries like, Willis McGee yeah. getting hurt in the bowl game against Miami. I mean, against Ohio State. Right. One of the worst injuries ever seen. And meanwhile, coaches jump ship like that. You know, they, they talk team and, <laughs> oh, and they talk that. team <laughs> and everything. And, and all of a sudden, they're going to a new school after a year or a month or whatever it was at Temple. Um, you know, it, so we've professionalized collegiate sports for everyone but the, the right. kids playing it. Yeah. Uh, so big the, co the right. coaches, the universities, and the colleges, the, the the conferences, and the NCAA, they all make money off of what these players are producing, and you know they're not getting anything for it. Granted, a scholarship is something, but are they getting the education they need once they're 
they're done playing because they're not going to play sports the rest of their lives. And most people are finishing their NBA careers or NFL careers broke in spite of what they made as a professional player. So I just think there's something ethically wrong about it being becoming a professionalized institution for everyone but I agree. everyone's playing. Hundred percent. They came and buy their own jersey in the in the team store. <laughs> yeah, look, uh, they can't afford. It. Yeah, a lot of times when coaches leave, though, like a lot of players lose their scholarships. Oh, like, yeah, there's players guys. that lose scholarships, like once they get new coaches in, too. That's a good point. And like then they're just kind of left hung right. out while this coach got a bunch of new bunch bunch of new money, or whatever. And you could take take the saxophone player at the college, and they can go to the nearby club on a Thursday night and, and play and make money. Yeah. You're not even allowed to work as a D1 athlete. You're not even allowed to have a job. Uh, to Zion's point, to your point, Red. Uh, like when I was in high school, I tore my hamstring, and I played. Football my senior year, I tried to. I remember that. Um, so do I. <laughs> <laughs> and I sat out. I, I, like I chose to go to Penn State, and I knew I was going to Penn State, and I wanted to be ready and at my best when I got there. So I sat out basketball season, trying to get ready. And to this day, I regret, regret not playing basketball my, my 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 senior year. So I think Zion, if he did sit out, he's always gonna have that question in the back of his head of what if. You think Joe regrets sitting out? Joe no, Harris? no. You think regret sitting out basketball? This is no. no. <laughs> well, no, out. Well, Joe finally. I think Joe only played. Uh, he only played basketball one year. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I'm just saying. If you so, still have an opportunity to win something, I'll, I think you would want to do that. I mean, if that they were say Duke was twelve and eleven, then maybe not. Maybe it ain't worth it. The but the fact they're going to go into the NCAA tournament and be a number one seed. You got a chance to play for a national championship. I mean, I would still be all in until that was no longer the case. Yeah. It depends on you knew you grew up with me. I could be at UNLV, like you said, I would still want to play. You would. I got out of practice and went <laughs> go play ball at the YMCA, play pickup yes. ball. So it's like you love you want to play and compete. Some kids are just, he seems like the type of kid that's built like that. Like I just want to play ball. I feel I feel like our our generation, I feel like we all were that. Like we put in the work, everybody was out um Everybody's doing the extra training to get there. Everybody was training on their own. Unless yeah. that push is still to I think the point I was, I was trying to make is that it's different when it's high school. Yeah, it is. Because when you get into college and at that level, we're only, what, 1% make it pros. Yeah. Yeah. There's just so much more at risk. There is. Yeah, I, I, was, I was certainly like you were when you were in high school. Yeah. You know, and I was like that in college, but I, didn't, I wasn't an athlete in college, and I didn't have a professional salary on my mind. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> so moving forward. Uh, yesterday, when, on Saturday, because uh, Lord knows when you'll watch this podcast, but on, <laughs> I, can't, I can't say yesterday, but uh, there was an incident down at Ole Miss. I think some more got the details on it, but the players took a knee on the basketball court during the national anthem in protest of a Confederate rally that was going on uh, a couple miles away. <laughs> On campus. On That's campus. Part of the campus. I think it campus. started off, right? It started yeah. off campus and then they brought it to So basically campus. there was two pro-Confederate flag rallies going on that day on campus. And uh, the player, Brian Tyree, was the one who started it. Was basically the main one. He took the knee. His teammates said basically we didn't want one of our guys out there alone doing it. They didn't warn they didn't forewarn the coach. He had no knowledge of it. And he basically said, we're tired of these hate groups coming to our school and, pro and portraying our campus like this, like our university having these hate groups in there. And so they want to do something about it. He said, no disrespect to the people who fight for this country, but we had to take a stand. But I think the major two issues, the coach he just hired in March, his name's Kermit Davis. Middle mm -hmm. Tennessee State, that's what he yes. said. When he was at Middle Tennessee State last year, he said that our players are going to stand and respect the anthem. And then at his press conference in March, he said his team will re represent the flag and anthem appropriately. He said uh, that they're basically they're going to stand for the anthem and there's going to be no protesting. So uh, maybe that's why the players didn't warn them. They just did it. We saw the video. I think initially it was three players on one knee, and mm -hmm. then two more took a knee, and I think two more took a knee. Yeah, it was like I think it was seven altogether. Yeah. Salute to those players. But he sat next to the coach and that Tyree kids that sat at the press conference yesterday after the game. And the coach seemed to support the player for taking a knee. AD supported him. He came out and said, uh, you know, he's, he's proud of the players. Coach didn't say anything like he was proud of the players. Yeah, he just he kind of didn't, he say, didn't anything, say anything. Really. But 
I mean, he didn't say, he didn't go off those same comments he went off of March either or at Middle Tennessee State. So, I mean, I'm sure he didn't probably didn't like it, but. Yeah, but the players came out, they said the right things. Yeah. He said, it's, uh, we need change on this campus. He said, people come to this campus and they're portraying it as this is a racist campus. And that's not the case. The way they made it seem like the sound like that, that happens all the time in that campus. That's the what it seemed like. They're coming to someone with racism yeah. and bigotry, and then and then they come here. Yeah. They don't. They start on campus, but they, they bring it to campus, campus and they finish on campus, and it makes it look like their campus is like a racist place to be. Well, they're taking down a Confederate monument. Right? <coughs> taking down a Confederate, Confederate monument. Confederate statue. Yeah, some statue that they're going to take down. I said during our pre-production meeting that you probably couldn't pay me enough money to live in Mississippi. Or Alabama, which I think is that's crazy. But why? I, why? Because you had that one event, and this guy says I can't live in that whole state. That's, that's definitely <laughs> not that one event. No, it's not that. No, one I'm just event. saying I'm you just have certain history. events, so you hear about them, when, and there are bigger stories when it's racism involved. No, I said you say I can't live anywhere down there. I think I, that's crazy. I said that uh, before, before this. You never been there, right? No. You're speaking on just on one event. I don't plan You're on speaking going. on some certain events that we hear in the news. Say, no, I, I'm speaking on the history of racism in those states. Like that's not even close. It's not debatable. No, I know. It's like racism, you've never I've been, been there in country though. If you look Google Lancaster right now, Lancaster City, you probably see the police thing that happened on, on uh, Prince Street where the kid get the guy getting tased. Yeah. You're only going to see negative stories in the news about a place. You never this, see the positive. The, the history is the history. Like it is. Oh, like the movie it Mississippi Burning. This is, this is not that. <laughs> that's, what that's what you're going off of. No, I'm going off of of like the civil rights stuff that was going on there for years. Like it's it yeah. don't, it don't change. They still have Confederate flags around there, like it's normal. I, like I, we have a our, our like I will go to Alabama this summer because I coach AAU basketball and the National Adidas Tournament is in uh, is in Alabama. Self love. Well, yeah, yeah, hello, hello. <laughs> Confederate flags been around. Until that dude shot that place up in South Carolina, and he had the flag That's, up there. You mean the church? I mean, no one made a big thing about. Yeah, he shot the church. I'm sorry, he shot the church up down in Charleston, but no one made a, like a huge deal about them flags until he no, it had it in the picture. It was an issue. But it wasn't as it wasn't as publicized as it is now. Because it's normalized because down there. Like if you if, if if you grow up down there, like it's normalized. It's normalized with a lot of places. I went to it's school with a kid who used to have a, one on the back of his truck. And it's, no one ever said anything. It's not just a South together. issue, but you go to Coryville, you're gonna see guys riding around in trucks with uh, Confederate flags. Yes, but it's not like it's Coryville is, is a smaller population. It's just like Coryville. Like they rarely, you you won't see in like Lancaster City or like other places, even in Lancaster County. But down there, it's seen more than it's not. I would agree. So, well, that's the Confederate states, and that's fine. So I would choose not to live there. Is just what I'm saying. I would choose not to visit there. I would say I visit first and then make a. Uh, as you let your son play football there. No, I, to 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 some large point, no. I don't want to visit there first. I don't want to go. I'm still mad. Like I got, I'm still mad about some of that stuff. <laughs> I'm saying educate yourself. Go down there, experience, and see for yourself, and then make a no, decision that you you're going to turn your son right off play, state. Can your son play at Ole Miss or Mississippi hold on, or Alabama? Hold on. Before that, you guys got this. Look, now we got in trouble last week. <laughs> <laughs> I'm curious what Coach is going to say. You're not doing these type of things. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I don't know if I'm allowed to do that. You can speak in any time you want to say. Absolutely. I want you to dive in on this. Dive in on this stuff. Don't wait. Don't hate. If, if, well, if you don't know. If you sit uh, back and wait, you're going to get a word in. Yeah, just come uh, in. So, so, so Dr. Mealy wrote wrote six books. And Five were published. Nah, it's Dave Chappelle. And a lot of and some of them were on civil rights, and a lot of them talked about the civil rights uh, movement that was happening here in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. So, yeah, we would definitely love to hear his his his, his, his uh, views on this topic. Are we talking about Mississippi All State, or are we talking about what happened yesterday? Let's start with <laughs> Old Miss first. Yeah, start with Old Miss. <laughs> so, um, it, not too long ago, two years ago three years ago, folks there were putting nooses over the, the statue, over the, the neck of the statue of uh, James Meredith, okay, the first African American to, to attend and graduate from Mississippi in the 60s. Uh, so that still happened. So two these, years ago. It, it was two or three years ago. It was not long ago at all. No. Um, the, uh, so these, the basketball players witness, are witness to that. Mm -hmm. um, for so long, the, the university flag had the Confederate flag in it. You know, for so long, the, the university's 
mascot was Colonel Reb in Confederate uniform. Um, so all that history is certainly there. And it's still a predominantly white space, the college is. So I don't know the number of non-white students that go to the University of Mississippi. I haven't researched it, but um, I'm pretty sure they're greatly outnumbered. Uh, so therefore, the, the feeling of those students on campus is probably one of alienation or isolation, uh, meaning that social, the social events are still predominantly white spaces where students of color don't feel comfortable at. Um, the, 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 you go to um, perhaps a sporting event or something off campus is still predominantly white space. So you have all of that that's going on in what, what uh, Mississippi's um, uh, black and brown students are experiencing on a daily basis um, and, and perhaps have the feeling that their voice isn't heard or when they speak up, someone speaks louder because they have, they're in positions of power and yeah, privilege on campus. Um, uh, so, and then all of a sudden you have this uh, uh, Confederate monument march going through campus uh, yesterday and um, that was their way of, of, of using their First Amendment. You know, the march happens because they have the First Amendment right to march through mm -hmm. the streets uh, to protect Confederate wow. monuments. Just because you have freedom of speech doesn't mean you have the freedom of its consequences. Right. Um, all the time. Or people will agree with you. So just like those basketball players didn't like the, the march going through campus, there's going to be people upset with the fact yeah. that they took a knee. Um, so you're going to have that debate going on. But that's happening on a college campus where, where conversations like that should happen. <laughs> now, now, Mississippi, uh, the, the history, what Brand is getting into, like, uh, I, I'm with you. I'm like, you haven't been there. Go there in the south. It's changing if you take a look at what happened at Georgia and, and the near victory, mm -hmm. the gubernatorial victory, um, just a couple months ago. There, mm -hmm. Right? So um, uh, North Carolina is a state voted, that voted for Obama. Virginia did, what, twice, I think? Twice. Um, the... Uh, so those southern states are changing. Um, so I wouldn't write it off. <laughs> but the, the, the fact that Brand is bringing up some history in the state of Mississippi, where, which led all the southern states in the number of lynchings that took place, recorded lynchings, not ones that weren't recorded, but re recorded, recorded lynchings, Mississippi leads the country. Um, and it's, it's state constitution when written at the end of Reconstruction, uh, post-Civil War Reconstruction was the harshest um, that was written and had Jim Crow laws written into it as years mm -hmm. went on into the 20th century. So that's what Brandon's getting into. That's one of the best stats I ever heard. I, never, I didn't know that about the lynchings. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. No, that's yeah. the first time I heard that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, yeah. Now, and, and a lot of people are still alive to witness that. You know, the, the Freedom Summer of 1964, folks are still on earth that, that witnessed the, the kind mm -hmm. of violence and, and intimidation that uh, white and black civil rights workers were trying to do to build uh, freedom schools. Uh, for students of color um, and to register black voters, you know, in the summer of 64, which, you know, tragically had three civil rights workers, um, uh, two white, one black, you know, Mickey Schwerner, Andy Goodman, and James Cheney killed, you know, and, and not just that happened, but while they were searching for those bodies, there were, there was other bombings of, of churches and, and proposed uh, locations for schools and, yeah, many people that were trying to protect those schools had to arm themselves, you know, looking for those that were arsonists. So That's all that really all that from. history is there. I think us not going there is what they want. We need to go to these places sure. and try to make change the, the mentality down there somewhat. Easier said than done, but I told I think uh, I told you or was it somebody? I forget. We had the conversation before, like with integration. You think black people are only people that want to be integrated to them? <coughs> like. You told me this, right? We had this car in, the, in the car a couple days ago. We go out our way to look for integration. Like, we get money, we move out to a different neighborhood that's predominantly white. Uh, like, I don't see white people looking to be integrated in our society, unless it's through, like, music, maybe. Why are, the city is on an upswing. A lot of people want to live in the inner cities now. That's my question. So you think it's not I would more... say you're, you're right that more we try to fit in with them more than they try to fit in with us. I would say I would agree with you with that, but I don't think it's... They do, it does happen. But do we have a choice? I yeah. feel like we have to integrate more with them. A lot of the things we do are almost owned by them. I don't say them like I'm segregating us and white people. I'm just saying like, 
a little easier to say that black people are white people, but. Well, Lancaster, no. It, like in Lancaster, we, yeah, I mean, we're, we're, we're going to have this issue. But like, I don't know, like PG County has one of the, the richest black uh, neighborhoods in America. We just don't have it here. Uh, but like in general, like once since segregation, it's almost been like black people have trying to fit in and do things the white way rather than, you know, because back then we had like our black banks, our black grocery stores and, and everything else like that. But we don't now. See, I don't even think about you gonna it. You want to live in a, 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 a race a, issue? You want to live in a, would you consider a nice neighborhood or you want to get a job that pays you a certain salary? You're going to have to, you're going to, by your words, integrating, but it's just trying to do better for yourself. See, I didn't put any thought you're into where surrounded I bought my by house. It. it just so happens the area I live in, yes, I might be the only black person there, but I didn't think about that. Yeah, I didn't think about that. When buying my house, I didn't think about that at the time. Like, oh, I want to be the only black person there. No, I felt like, okay, this is the house I love. Why can't I live here? <laughs> I've never thought color, never thought I race, didn't either. nothing. I my house. I'm in an all-white neighborhood, but I didn't think go there. I want to move it to a white neighborhood. I just wanted to buy a house that I like, a nice area with and a good school. And it happened to be that area. And it happens to be like predominantly white. That's how different our mind frame and thinking. That's why we do a podcast. I like having these guys What's on. What school? What'd your kids go to? Penn Manor. Hambright. Okay. Um, Millie asked me, like, a while ago, remember when you asked me to... Would I like to move into your house? Or buy yeah. your, what was my first question and like response back to you? I, I'm, I'm thinking you asked me how many people of color live in America. <laughs> yeah, that's the first thing I had. See, that's how different like our, our thinking process is. So it's funny that you guys think that and we have like different ways of thinking. That's good for the podcast. But you move where you live now. It's not predominantly black, Spanish, black or brown, what you want to call it. It is. I mean, it's, we have a lot of minorities in our neighborhood. Uh, I don't want to like list the houses that they <laughs> are, but uh, there are. And when I moved there, you know, I, it was more because Palm was right next door too. But uh, back to my original point, like it seems like we go out of our way to integrate when we don't, when they're not really looking for people for us to integrate them. Like, go ahead. can I jump in? Yes. Yeah. yeah. I gotta ask. <laughs> 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 well, you guys ask me here to talk about sports. I know, but we always get on top of it. <laughs> so, um, Brandon has a point. Like, I agree that he's saying that what he's trying to say is that integration was for the benefit of white people. It was a, it was a benefit of white people to, 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 as an acknowledgement of historical injustice that happened. Integration, or what Brandon is trying to say, token integration, was not to truly try to integrate life for people of color because what still existed was still predominantly white schools where you had nine black students go to Central High in Little Rock, Arkansas, you know, or Ruby Bridges goes to William Franz Elementary in New Orleans. You know, we're talking one, we're talking single digits here. We're not talking full integration. And every teacher was still white and the curriculum was still white or white middle class oriented curriculum. Um, that's what you're getting at with communities. And the trend is showing in communities that no, when people of color are moving in, whites are leaving, and whites are not moving into um, communities of color. Like that, that's not what the statistics uh, uh, show today. So true integration would be integration in positions of power. And, and, it, and it, would be, it would be an effort to try to, um, to eradicate um, uh, you know, systems of, of uh, power structures, more of a white supremacist, um, Institutions that we have in the country go all the way from education to the economy to to um, I don't know give me government some, uh, to government <laughs> yeah um, you know that that's 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 racism to me racism racism to me is not something as simple as the the individual racist that you have to deal with at work Systemic okay racism. or the, the or or at the mall yeah you know but racism is is one racial ra racial group being able to embed their biases and their prejudices into the institutions of the country in a way that privileges them while it oppresses other races. I've always said the bigger racism is not the guy at the at the corner store that doesn't want you in there because you're black. It's the guy that you go for a job that you're qualified for and he just says that you're, you know, you didn't make, he doesn't hire you because you're black, but he's not saying that, but you're qualified for the position. Well, see, th Those are the racism that hurts us as a people. There's a name for that. It's called the KKK fallacy. And that the, the idea that, well, racism doesn't exist anymore in the country because we don't have laws 
that separate whites and blacks anymore. They, they all went, you know, gone with the wind in the 60s. And because those laws don't exist and therefore racism doesn't exist. No, that's right. And that's not the case. People measure, many people measure racism based on, oh, I can identify that person as a racist because yeah, of the way like the one that he behaved. About. But that, that's not what the problem in this country that is. The problem the in this country is, the, is not just that. So what you're getting into is what's called a, the class fallacy, which is only poor whites are racist are racist. No, I said closet. Oh, closet? Closet mentality well, that, 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 in, in, in public, you're fine, you love that, nothing against race, but behind closet doors, you're like, I'm not gonna, I will never hire one. What? I don't want one with my daughter, stuff like I agree, that. No, I, I agree with that. And that's why I say this fallacy of class is that, well, well wealthy whites who lean left mm -hmm. politically, they're not racist, but I think we've seen that in mm -hmm. many viral videos that have gone. I mean, they, there was that lawyer in New York City that was attacking um, Spanish-speaking people that worked in, I don't know if you remember that, it was last spring. Mm -hmm. I can't remember the guy's name. Or the, but no, poor white, wealthy white. Superintendent down in Texas recently, about Deshaun Watson. Deshaun. Stuff like that happens. You get caught texting saying, oh, you can never have a black quarterback because this is why. And you would never think mm -hmm. he's racist. But anyway, look, look at York, look at Harrisburg, look at Lancaster. Let me look at these schools. And they're segregated schools today. They're segregated schools, so they've, they've resegregated. It's just where they were when our grandparents were alive or they were all white, now they're all schools of color and white students have left them. So our schools are just as segregated today as they were 50, 60 years ago. Mm -hmm. And there's no true integration effort to, to try to get white students uh, to go to this particular school and um, black and brown students go to a different school where we're truly integrating our schools. That's not happening. We've resegregated. Mm -hmm. That's one of the things I talked about uh, I was talking about the past. I know you are a big activist of it, just with um, teaching against racism in schools. Yeah. So, like having classes on racism and what exactly it looks like, and maybe like how can we divide it? Because people might grow up a certain way, not even knowing that they're racist, racist yeah. or they have racist views or ignorant views, as Samar was talking about last week. Uh, so maybe if we educated them in schools, they would have a better opportunity to, to graduate and just be more flexible and open-minded to yeah, different I things. Think. So there was, a, there was a, the Charlottesville um, violence that happened in Charlottesville in 2017. There was a father who noticed his son was in it. His name was Peter Teft. And um, he wrote a letter to his local paper. I think it was from um, uh, Wisconsin or something, Minnesota maybe. And he wrote a letter to his local paper disowning his son. And in the letter, he said, um, um, we, you know, in our household, we remain silent about these issues. And um, as, a way to, as a way to say we're a colorblind family. <clears throat> well, I see that line, we remain silent, as damage, as, just as damaging as if Thank you me. had the parent who was mm -hmm. selling, saying racist things. What white America has become is like color silent. And in that their silence is deafening and their, their silence feeds into the systemic forms of racism because the parents have chosen not to talk to their kids about race. I took my son, who's four, I took him to uh, Jamia by the movie theater and the, Chi the Chinese restaurant. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, I did it intentionally because he had never been to a Chinese restaurant before. And we sat down and what happened, what I thought was gonna happen exactly happened. Our, our, our waitress came to us and she she took our order. She, she while standing there, my son goes, she sounds funny. You know, she was, spoke Chinese accent. And most white parents would say, shh, don't be rude. I agree. Um, I had thought this out in advance, and I said, I know, isn't that a, a pretty and beautiful accent? And then I broke out my phone, and we, I put on a bunch of videos about China. Mm -hmm. And you know, he watched videos on the Great Wall and, and food culture and everything, and, and, and he loved it. Um, but most parents avoid the conversation with their kids because they think if they bring it up, they may actually teach their kids like their kids may actually um develop these racist feelings if they're racist they just avoid it and, and i was getting that good. last week when i was saying about <laughs> educating somebody that they don't know they're not racist they're just ignorant they have lack of knowledge absent of knowledge i said you're around somebody and you can educate them about black culture the proper words to use that um you're helping them out they don't, they don't want to be racist they just don't know and you said that well they should read a book they're indifferent <laughs> Well, yeah, but different. I've been around a lot of people now that I feel like they learned a lot just by working with me because they didn't know. And they're comfortable asking certain questions. I grew up like at all white schools outside of McCaskill. 
uh, in college, it, you have to want to be educated. Like you have to want to be open-minded. And at times, don't you get fed up after a while? Of don't try to come like to me and act like you're not. So, I mean, just act like you want to be something you're not because you might have said something. You're not coming into this thing in advance thinking, you know, well, what is the correct way to do it? You, they mess up, and then they're like, oh, well, what did I do wrong? And that's the part that maybe I'm frustrated with by the age I'm getting to now. Like, I'd rather just keep I it away from it takes two open-minded parties. So when I visited you at Penn State and Townsend, for what I remember, all your friends you had there were black, right? Yes. So you never felt like you tried to what, assimilate yourself to be into their culture and try to learn the white people? Or did you just like subconsciously just go gravitate towards your own? That's normally what you do. I mean, you I walk in a is. room and you look around. And you go to the black crowd. And yeah, and you, get, and, and you go to, to people that you're familiar with. It's now, there, there's been times where I walked in a room and there wasn't, and you just go sit at your desk by yourself. Yeah, Instead I think it's just going, not healthy, you know, though. But I understand mm -hmm. it. When I go to a resort, like I went to Mexico last May, and you go to the resort, and there was the other one other black couple. I think everybody even been like black Hispanics, but that's who they are. We're gonna be cool with them in the resort. You kind of just you look around, you try to see what's comfortable for you. But I think you're better off going to the pool bar, like, and then getting around a bunch of different people and just talking with all races. Yeah. <clears throat> but you do grab We tend to gravitate towards our own people. Well, see, that's where so you leave your house and and you think about your race and because you know that most of the places you're going to go are white spaces. Mm -hmm. And white people don't do that. And their, parent, that and their parents don't have the conversation. Like, you, like um, Brandon has told me, he and his folks have had the talk about how to act if confronted by a police officer or whatnot, mm -hmm. position of authority. And white families just don't have that, those conversations. So it, it, it's easy for a white person not be racist, but be racially indifferent and not know, be like a Ralph Northam who does blackface in the 1980s, but since you're at a, a, a white space or a white feel institution, you feel comfortable to do that because there's no one really to check your behavior, and there's not that feeling of two-ness that people of color have in the country. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. All right, so we got coach on. We got to get to some sports. I got a sports-related question. <laughs> <laughs> can we, is, 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 can we, we still stay on sports? <laughs> well, let's ask him coach. Let's, let's ask him questions about coaching, or his coaching career, or. Let's get something out of him being here besides him educating. <laughs> <laughs> I got a question for you because you'll see more, mostly at the pro level now, where coaches are going towards specializing in one side of the ball. Like you might get a Cliff Kingsbury who says, I'm only going to do offense. They'll bring in a D coordinator and they don't know nothing what's going on on either side of the ball. Do you consider yourself a like one side of the ball coach or do you, are you like a round around it? No. No. <laughs> both sides. Both sides. That's yeah. what I remember yeah. from you. So, um, what we did at McCaskey when I was an assistant. And then uh, what we did at Penn Manor and now at Lancaster Catholic is every coach on the staff coaches on both sides of the football. And that includes me. I think that's good. Um, so, for example, our offensive coordinator, Bordiak, he coaches in the secondary with Brandon. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, uh, Brandon, as a secondary, he's also the wide receivers coach. Um, uh, our DC, Jared Shearer, he coaches the running backs um, on the offensive side. And then I work with him with the running backs on all. Well, really, I go anywhere that's needed mm -hmm. on offense. Like we have a coach missing or something that day. I, I, and then uh, on the defensive side, we work together. Uh, and then our, our, our we have a couple line coaches, my Reno um, and Swagger. They help each other on the offensive line and defensive line. The reason why I, I, I want to stay with that is because I think it creates division amongst the staff. I agree. If, you know, if if. One season you have the offense performing, the defense not performing. There's gonna be a lot of fingers pointing. Mm -hmm. Another year it's gonna be vice versa. So in this in this sense, it gets um, stakeholders on both sides. There's not the finger pointing. There's not the bad mouthing behind people's back, and we're all accountable for how one side of the ball is performing. Do you think you're stronger on one side? Like if you had to set well, yourself to a college program. Well, I'll just speak statistically. We've always been better on defense. Mm -hmm. um, uh, for as long as this coaching staff has been together, with the exception of our last two years of Penn Manor. Um, we were better on offense those two years. Is like that coaching related or personnel related? I, I just think, I think it was personnel. That's what I was going to yeah, say. Yeah, I think it was personnel. Um, but for instance, this year at Lancaster Catholic, we had the best, statistically the best defense in, in the, the LL League. Mm -hmm. Same last year, and then we were second best the year before. 
So like we've been performing on that side of the football. Um, you know, and, and usually we win a, we've been able to win a lot of games because of how we played on defense. And then our last year, Penn Manor, we went um, six and five. We got a lot of injuries that year, um, but we couldn't win tight games because we didn't perform on defense the way we, we did in other years. I asked that because I remember, I see you as more of a defensive coach, but when you were your first year coaching on our undefeated freshman championship team, <laughs> <laughs> only one ever. Without Mr. B. Way, you know, who's already varsity <laughs> ready. And Joel, and yeah, Joel. and Joel Holler. I, I even said this, it kind of reminds me like McVay now, yeah. but you were, because you were what, what, 23 maybe? Oh no, I was. I think I was 20. 20, yeah, he was our coach. <laughs> but you were Joel, I feel like we were running an offense that was way we, more advanced than we, anybody else. We were big, we were shovel passing. Yeah, we were doing all kinds <laughs> yeah. of this yeah. elaborate offensive scheme, but you were the offensive coordinator. Yeah. And Kamara was the defensive coordinator, but you seem like you're more a defensive coach now. But I remember you just drawing up plays and being innovative as an offensive guy. Well, I'm very involved in the offense okay. at, at Catholic. Um, you know, uh, I'll watch the film, our OC will watch the film, and then we'll chat Saturday night before we have our staff meeting. And then we have a staff meeting, and Brandon can speak specifically too, but um, it, it's, it's a wide open conversation. Mm -hmm. So, um, even in spite of uh, Gordon and I's conversation on Saturday night, Sunday morning, he'll come in and he'll he'll put up on the board what he thinks, what he wants to do, what he what he thinks will be successful for the week, um, and we'll say here are the flaws, and no, we should probably do this. So we have those conversations, and it's good we work together, where our egos don't get in the way. Yeah. Um, you know, because we're able to go to a staff meeting and uh, really incorporate everybody's idea into the game plan. That's where diversity is good. Yeah. That's what you were saying a minute ago. Yeah. About this podcast. <laughs> yeah. uh, one of the big things here, you know, we had uh, like Coach, we had uh, Coach Smallwood on from Harrisburg, and we had Coach Gallon on from York. Who, uh, if York wins on Monday, they'll be in uh, district championships. So, uh, good luck to them guys. But uh, they're both public guys, and they had they had they had the debate about the the public private battle that's going on right now. So being on the private side of things, what are your what are some of your thoughts on public versus private thing that's going on, and is it fair? Is it not fair? Okay. And that whole debate. Okay. So I'm an equity guy, and if PIAA chooses to create separate playoff systems, so be it. All right. Um, I'm just not on the front line of this battle. <laughs> the ironic thing with that, to speak politically, is I'm wondering a lot of these people fighting for equity now, they vote <laughs> against equity when it doesn't impact their careers. Right? Yeah, like, you um, vote for their own interests. <laughs> right. And every, and every vote. So I, I, I'm just leery of, of motivation here, and I'm always cautious about who's sitting at the table to make these conversations. I do not yes. think the right people are at the table um, when, when PIAA makes a decision. Um, so that's one thing to keep in mind. Uh, the second is, it's a small minor argument, but really every school out there is non-boundary. You know, yeah. I, when I was teaching at McCaskey, I had students from Penn Manor District, LS District that were going to McCaskey to be students in the IB program. They were just paying the tuition mm -hmm. to go there. So technically, every school out there is non-boundary. If you can afford you can to pay the tuition. If you can afford to pay the tuition. Which limits uh, a lot of people. Yeah. Well, right. right. True. Um, still. Um, but I'm glad you brought the IB program. McCaskey <laughs> has a strong education system there. People don't believe it though. I, I could I, I could have retired with that teaching job there. Right. I, I really loved my colleagues there and the students I taught there. And I had the best of both worlds because I I, I taught IB, but I also didn't teach IB. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I, I coached both weightlifting and football. Mm -hmm. So I worked with every student that was that was in that building. Um, here, it, it, but there's one more thing on my mind about this debate, which is if folks are worried about recruiting. And you know, ninety-two percent of our roster this year were kids that went through the Catholic school system. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, you know, on one hand, we're, we're students that transferred in, and if it wasn't for privacy issues, if people heard the reasons why they were in our school, they would be sympathetic. Mm -hmm. I know it's different in Philadelphia. Like I think the Philadelphia area, area those those private schools along the border with Jersey and Delaware is making it difficult for schools like Lancaster Catholic and Trinity. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the recruiting part, I have a problem with these, these for-profit football organizations, combines, elite things that you want to call them, like mm -hmm. what happens at Spooky Nook. Because mm -hmm. that's where some recruiting happens. And I, I think if you want fair play, then if you're coaching a high school team 
it's too much of a of a conflict of interest. You mm -hmm. No, for you to be coaching in those those combines, oh, yeah. whatever you want to call them, and holding those clinics, and, and holding those clinics, kind of like a mm -hmm. yeah. hardball. Because because now because yeah. yeah. now you're working yeah. with kids from every school, and it, you know you know how like yeah, <laughs> parents, if your kid's not in there the whole time, like if he's not in the game, he's not starting the game. You know, and if he plays a quarterback position and only one can be on the field at, at one time, uh, and and you're at that combine and your kid's doing success throwing against air, you know, or, or your kid is a wide out and have a success catching a ball against air without a defender there, yeah. and they're having success, then you know they'll look in other places. That's why I think there's a conflict of interest to see high school coaches uh, working at those those combines, because that's where I think. Of the kind of on the same topic, the LL voted on Thursday expand from three to four sections starting in 2020. Yeah, and I guess you guys are gonna be section three. Section three. How do you feel about that? <sighs> it's it, it's tough. Um, uh, we're projected in, when that starts to be a, the size of a two A school. So you don't play up. And we're every team we're gonna play is up. So every team we're gonna play, we have a six A team on the schedule, five A team on the schedule, and the rest are four A. Mm -hmm. You know, we're gonna be two A, maybe feeling a roster of 30. You know, like that's what our projections are right now. Um, so that I mean, that's going to make it tough for us. Yeah. yeah. Plus, some of the section two, three teams are pretty good now. LS, but with the Calico. See, that, it's interesting you're saying that because uh, before before your buddy here was coaching in section three, you probably didn't have many nice things to say about it because <laughs> you didn't know about it, right? The well, Calico, I, Co they're on the rise. City bigger schools seem to be on the. Mainly, I'm saying like McCaskey, inner city schools, are, the bigger schools are going down football wise. Yeah. The football programs have been. Look, the football, the football in Central Pennsylvania, and the football in the LL League is good, and these these coaches are good. Um, and what Section Three coaches have been able to do is really, like, make a lot out of little. You know, they're, 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 these are schools with rosters ranging from 24 kids to 35 kids, and they're able to teach them and keep them healthy, and be able to keep compete throughout the entire year. And every game we played in it was competitive. You know, I mean, this last year, you know, you take like an effort up. You know, they were something like 10 points away from going seven and three. You know, instead they're five and five. Mm -hmm. You know, Lebanon has one of the best defenses and they got better as the year went on. Um, you know, section section three is as tough as any other section. I think it's going to be the toughest section out of the four. You think so? Competitively, yeah. with the teams being balanced, yeah. I think I think it will. Yeah. Now I do think this coaching staff being together for so long and having you know played in section or coached and competed in section one for you know more than a dozen years, I think that's that's I think that did a lot for us this past year in terms of experience and game prep and all that. And what do you feel about possibly merging with uh, Burks? League in the 2023 uh, I, I really don't have a positive opinion on that, on that right now. <laughs> and, um, I just, I don't. You know, um, what's the reason for people pushing this thing in the next? Uh, well, I, I, th I think, I think the 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 benefits are for those in, in the Berks County. Okay. Yeah. Um, I don't know much about Berks Berks League. I think you might know a little more for coaching, obviously. Yeah. Um, I'm just not a fan of it. Yeah. Yeah, but maybe if I hear more about it, my opinion will change. But I hope it doesn't happen. So if you get the vote, you're saying no. That would be my vote. Yeah. So being a Harrisburg guy, how do you compare, like the, uh, <laughs> uh, the like Harrisburg football rather uh, versus like Lancaster football, high school? You say Mid Penn versus LL? Yeah, yeah, I think that's what he's saying, right? Yeah, that's what it sounds like. <laughs> yes. Well, I'm sorry, Mid Penn versus the LL. Um, look, Mid Penn has those elite teams uh, that we've seen in the playoffs. Um, yeah, we, we played in, in our career coaching. We played against McDevitt. We played against Harrisburg. We played against Cumber Valley a couple of times. Really, the only elite one we haven't played is Central Dolphin. Um, those coaching staffs are very good. Uh, they're consistent, like meaning the coaching staffs have stayed on board. Like the, all the assistants haven't been bouncing around. They've stayed together, and that's what's made those teams elite. Um, the uh, in the LL League, I think the coaches are excellent, top to bottom. <clears throat> but I think the numbers are down in Lancaster mm -hmm. when you compare them to Harrisburg. Uh, I do think there's a bigger draw to the to the Mid Penn schools being around the capital. Yeah. So I think there there's I think there's more players. I think I think the talent from especially up top is is better than than in our area. Um, and when Mid Penn teams have played Lancaster LL teams, Mid Penn has won most of those. Um, so I think that's what you measure it up now. Um, 
it's tough when people say, well, here's where this kid goes to college and that kid's going to college. Yeah, I yeah. think I think you have to measure when when there's competition in, in the playoffs or if they schedule, you know, out of leagues. Now we we've also played some of the mid pen teams in the middle, and you know, teams that we've coached have been successful. You know, so we've lost to the elites, but we've had success yeah. against those right there in the middle. And that's both. That's both. In, that's both. In, I guess we did coach against CD when I was at McCaskey and he played. Mm-hmm. Right, we played them in the playoffs. That's but, but, yeah, it was challenging. Yeah, yeah, but at Penn Manor and Lancaster Catholic, um, you know, we've been able to win against those middle tier teams as opposed to the McDevitts, Cumber Valleys, and Harrisburg. We got a question from uh, Alex Cruz <clears throat> for Coach Miller. He said, "What's the difference we you see in coaching kids from Catholic versus kids from McCaskey and parent involvement?" Well, <clears throat> yeah. oh, you parent, you threw parents on the end of that. The, um, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a <laughs> I just have a question. So give too, you, question. Let me give you two, two or three <laughs> answers and. Um, this, is this Alex Senior or Junior? Uh, senior. Okay. Kids are the same no matter where, where I've been. They're, they like the same music. They wear the same clothes. They talk the same. So the kids have been the same. Um, in trying to manage teams, uh, it's been, well, in Lancaster Catholic, we have the roster smaller, and we've had more kids that have played multiple sports at Catholic, or in other words, we don't have them around in the off season like we were fortunate to have at Penn Manor and then at McCaskey. You know, just McCaskey, just because the roster was so large, we had a lot of kids coming to workouts. You know, Penn Manor, there wasn't a lot of dual sport athletes, so we had a, a good turnout when it came to our off season workouts with football. At Catholic, you know, our roster, you know, somewhere around 33, you know, and we have right now 18, 16, 18 coming to workouts. Um, and and it, with that, it's tough to convince those kids that haven't played football in a couple of years to come back out for football, you know, like they played when they were middle school age, yeah. and then they stop playing in high school, it's tough to get them back out because they're busy. And then there's never an opportunity to get them to experience what this coaching staff is like. It's a really fun coaching staff to play for. Um, we invest in the kids. Uh, I, we're good teachers. and But those kids that are on the border never get to experience that because they're busy playing basketball in the winter mm-hmm. or baseball in the spring. Now, with parents, <laughs> look, parents are parents. The thing at Catholic is because of the way that it's set up with the athletic department, that um, you know we don't have an athletic or we don't have a booster club like like I had to manage at Penn Manor. Um, so in that sense, uh, I don't interact with the parents at Lancaster Catholic as much as I've had to interact with them at my two previous schools. Uh, there's some good and bad. The the bad with that is um, it's tough to get the Lancaster Catholic parents to get involved in you know some of the fundraising things and organizational things we want to do. Mm-hmm just because there's not a relationship. Um, and a booster club would help with that. <laughs> the, the, the positive, from my point of view, is that I'm not gonna, I, I don't deal with parents that expect their kids to play just because they're the president of the, of the yeah. uh, booster club <laughs> or the vice president of the booster club. So, because that's everywhere. That's mm-hmm. just not my experience, that's at every school. You know, if, if, if a parent is investing X amount of hours, they're expecting their kid mm-hmm. to get some favoritism, that's just not how it works. So I really haven't had to deal with that at, at Lancaster Catholic. So I'm, I'm, you know, having finished a full year as, as a head coach, I'm still weighing and measuring, you know, the absence of a booster club, mm-hmm. you know, whether or not that's beneficial or not. For, so with that said, do you see a difference between the scholastic athlete from early 2000s, maybe 15 years ago, till now? <sighs> well, I mean, I can only talk about the kids that I coached. Yeah, but you were uh, where? Pat Manor, McCaskey, Catholic, you've seen athletes. You had us when we were young. Right. Just from refereeing, I feel like kids are more entitled, it seems like, athletes. and they're, uh... Yeah, I'm always – is it because you're older? You know, <laughs> is it because you're older and you, and you just you see things differently? You see, you see things differently. And, and when you were a teenager and you were acting entitled, you just didn't notice it? It's possible. Very possible. <laughs> um, I just feel like – I always looked in where I felt like with competition. I never blamed. It's always there's just always an excuse now. Yeah. If a kid don't play well, it's because the coaches hate them. If the team don't win, the referees rob them. I don't remember being like that at our. I always feel like it might have been. That's the same. it's always been <laughs> always been that way. You just didn't know because you were a kid. Yeah, it's always been like that. And um, you know, really, when when you're at a place that um, at a high school that runs like a top notch booster club where you have a ton of parents involved, you deal with that more. Um, you, you know, with, with, in terms of expectation, what you owe me. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, you know, I, 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 I'll be, say this bluntly, <laughs> having gone to school at McDevitt and so attended and, and was a student and was an athlete at McDevitt 
been coached now at a Catholic school, there is a sense of entitlement about winning a game mm -hmm. um, that I that I see it at Catholic and, and observing at McDevitt now than what I experienced at Penn Manor and at uh, McCaskey, two public schools. So um, that is something that our coaching staff really tries to, to talk to our kids about. You know, it doesn't matter how many state championships like your Catholic has won in history. That doesn't entitle you to one. Yeah. And it doesn't matter what this team, what their record was last year. That ent doesn't entitle you to beat them this year. Yeah, you didn't earn it. They, right. They that, that, that's, that's the thing with kids that, that we're dealing with. Is, is not, you know, is, is having them respect everybody that we've got. Uh, having them to respect every future that they have, you know that that that's tough. I mean, yeah, but it does now. it doesn't help though when they go home, and if they have a parent saying to them, you know, something that goes against what coaches. Are I think it's because, it gets a little worse as they get older now because now even if you don't win, you're still getting a medal. I hate like that. every kid's <laughs> got to get a medal, every kid's got to get a trophy. So mm -hmm. even if they lost or they quit or whatever, they still get that. They still get that medal. And I've seen you get mad about that before. Look, I get, I, I do a city program with. Uh, Girls, three to six basketball league, and I give out four awards. Third, third to sixth grade. Third to sixth, yeah. Mm -hmm. Not three to six years old. Oh yeah, yeah, third to sixth grade. <laughs> I'm sorry, yeah. And uh, I give four awards out: Heart and Hustle, Most Improved, Future Star, and uh, Leadership. And the last two seasons after the awards, issue with the parents because their kid didn't get it. Yeah. So and I, and what we did um, years ago was we stopped giving out. Awards at banquets, you know, like there's our offensive that player. That's not the answer. I feel like. Well, okay, let me answer it a different way. <laughs> One of the, my least favorite things to do as a coach is pick captains, because um, there's other kids on the team that are just as deserving to be a captain because they've worked hard and they've attended workouts and they're at practice and they give it their all. Uh, but yet, four captains are chosen. That's life, though. Everybody can't make the cut. <laughs> we can't get a sure. traveling team in the city right now because uh, they're scared of cutting kids. Yeah, that, that, that's that's, a, that's I feel like that's an issue. Like I was cut, I was cut from Keystone Games. But that 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 plays a role in how you see the level of McCaskey basketball went down because of that. Like I think that's one of the reasons that we don't see the talent level. I mean, there's plenty of other reasons too, but that's just one of them that we're not having the kids play against the top competition all the way through. You gotta ref games at these rec leagues where you gotta like, you know, get special time. Yeah. yeah. Look, I wasn't I wasn't quite done. I wanted I just wanted to finish my point about these you know, this captain issue is that you have there's kids on the team that are deserving mm -hmm. to stand in front of their teammates and be a leader or a captain that week because they've deserved deserved it. And I, I just I just feel that, that in some some incentive would be lost if we weren't showing a kid on the team that you also have value, mm -hmm. you know, and what you do by making that person a captain, as opposed to say, here's these four kids and we're going to be captains the entire year. So what, what we what we've always done is we choose captains every week. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, now we don't you, give uh, but we but yet we don't give trophies to everybody, you know, <laughs> which was the, what I was saying to you about the the banquet. Yeah. You know, because then then there's there, there is division and parents are involved in that as well. Why didn't my son get this? Yeah, and I, but I felt like. So this year I had a real t a tight uh, race between two girls, but the one girl definitely deserved it. There was no way around. This girl deserved it. And the issue was, like, well, she won it last year. Am I doing her a disservice by not giving her a award or she earned and giving it to this girl who's a good runner-up, but she didn't earn it? So now she don't get it, and I got to deal with parents calling into the my bosses saying, my, my daughter deserved this. And I think it's such, such a bad example in life. Where, well, you didn't win it. It's tough. Like, I got cut from Keystone. I know, but it drove to me over the summer to be better, get better. Well, we have different interests. Like, parents, I'm growing up now and raising one, an athlete, like, we have different interests. Like, a coach's interest is winning and, and, right. and, and the best for the team. As in parents, we're looking at, well, what is the best, best for, your kid for our kid? Yeah. So, it's, it's, you're going to always have that division. At the age of our kids now, it's not even about winning with coaches now. Like, everyone's got to play. Everyone's got to <laughs> And that's the thing I was telling you last week about my son. My son plays in the league, it's like a church league and basketball, and because he wasn't getting the same equal playing time as everyone else, and I was wondering why, but I didn't want to be that parent. So I waited three games, like why is he not playing as much as the rest of the kids? Well, so I talked to his coach last week. Well, because he's great, and I know he's the, one of the better players out there. Like I can see that as a parent or a coach, whatever. So the coach says, well, your son's rated number one player in our league. 
so he don't need as much playing time if the kids is not so good. He's trying to get, which is the craziest thing I've ever heard. Right. <laughs> like you're telling me my son is very number one player in this league, but so he doesn't need to play as much as the kid that can't even dribble. And he's like, yeah, that's how it, how the league works. <laughs> that's crazy to me. I mean, it was crazy to hear that to say, I mean, when I was growing up, it was all about who were the best five players out there, and that was who was playing. Mm -hmm. And now it's not like that anymore. How old? It's like, how old? He's six. Mm -hmm. Now he's, you know, <laughs> it, exactly. But, and he's mad because he's sitting on the bench. Like, why am I not playing as much as you guys? I think the big issue is like they play six quarters. And he's playing two quarters. Everyone else is playing three or four. <laughs> and I was like, well, why? Because he's got fourteen points already. Nobody else has scored. But that's, I don't understand. As a parent, it makes me mad, but it's like, and what do you do? development, too. Like, it exactly. Development, like, he right? still yeah. needs to work yeah. as well. And <laughs> this is like, that's what we become, though, as, like, almost society. Like, oh, well, these, these kids need more work, so your son's fine. All right, so we got to we gotta get Coach out of here. Let's have him with... Uh, I got a big question I want to ask before we get him out of here. All right, let's go two more questions. I'll make it quick. All right. Do you have a unique experience of being at a, mm -hmm. a big public inner city school, a public suburban school, and, a, you know, a private school, Catholic school? To put you in a unique position. So two years ago, McCassie had some kids kneel before the football game. And uh, I'm curious how you handle that and if you would handle it differently at each at each of the schools. <coughs> no, I wouldn't handle it differently. Um, I know the reaction from the community is going to be different at each one. Mm -hmm. But I, I wouldn't. Um, uh, I would expect from the players to, to talk to their teammates and tell them, give them their informed um, resolution of why they're doing why they're this. doing it. Now, I think, in my opinion, I don't know for sure that these kids just kneel because it was popular at the time. This is when Kaepernick was right. first kneeling. But they, you know, we're going kneel too. They probably didn't read up on the issues. But I remember some people being upset about it. I don't know what the coach did there. I'm not really in touch with McCaskey's football program right now. But this might not be as short as you want it. <laughs> <laughs> Look, yeah. So I can go all day. This, uh, this, is, this is good. Yeah. I, I might get in some uncharted territory here, but the, uh, the 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 idea about kneeling it does become a fad, especially with high school kids. Mm -hmm. um, in the '60s, you had um, African American students were occupying administrative buildings on campus, and then sometimes you had that trickling down to high schools because it was the thing to do and the story to tell. Mm -hmm. So sometimes that happens, but so half over half the country doesn't um, understand why basketball players at Mississippi would have taken a knee yesterday. Mm -hmm. Because to many folks, the flag only represents the military. Yeah. Um, but that flag for African Americans, underneath that flag has That's also me. been slavery, 900 years of Jim Crow. Impression. And then after that, other de facto forms of segregation to present day. Um, that, you know, that. So the flag means something different to you than it means to me. Um, so there's very little acknowledgement of that. You know, if if we had two national anthems played before games, one was the Star Spangled Banner and the other was Lift Every Voice and Sing, which is a Negro national anthem, what would happen? What would white people do if that national anthem was also played? Um, and what would be the reaction there? So um, I just, I, I'm at the point in my life where here are my convictions. And if I was at Penn Manor and I had students that told me, I had players that told me they wanted to take a knee, I would give them my support, but I would tell them, tell your teammates why you're doing it. And then when it came, when, it, when I got called in to talk to the administration, why'd you let this happen? I, I would tell them. Um, uh, but all of that nuance has to be discussed among the people out there that are debating this issue. You know, World War One ended and for the next 40 years, Every November 11th was Armistice Day, mm -hmm. and in 1954 it changed to Veterans Day. What was Armistice Day? It actually encouraged people to, to step back and question military decisions because we just fought a war and no one knows why we were in that war. Yeah. And, and 100,000 Americans died and you know upwards of 20 million people across the world died because of that war. So for so long it was okay in our culture to, to, to question some decisions that were being made because a small number of people were sending a lot of people off to serve in war and make the ultimate sacrifice. Old man, so um, gonna make die. Yeah, but like, but that, so that, but that flag should only represent the military. It should represent teachers too. It should represent doctors too. Mm -hmm. Right, that's what it also should represent. But there is that history underneath that. You know, those stars and stripes. You know, we had slavery and we had Jim Crow and we had all that. You know, underneath that flag. So what do you do if you're at 
Ben Manor and the administration comes to you and says this can't happen no more. I might take a position on it. It takes a bigger man to take a, you know, put yourself at risk. A lot of people ain't willing to sacrifice their own career for well, <clears throat> See, our, our head coach at Stevens this year was completely against Mewing. Mm -hmm. Um, we all know who he was, our head coach. Just I think most are. I, was, think, I think I'm in. I'm, I'm one of the few that's an exception. We, we talked about it in the office one day, and I disagree with us. I said they should be their choice. They want to do it. You know, you should, it's their right. And he was completely against allowing it on the team and even thinking maybe that they would, wouldn't be able to play if they did it before the game. That's how, that's how, this is how he felt about it. I mean, he wasn't. I, mean, I don't see him as like a racist. Well, this, this is a sports like, and this is a sports right. and politics podcast. Yes. So I un I understand why you guys would deliberate over this, in, you know, every week, you mm -hmm. know, as the country should. But um, sports and politics are not separated, and they never have been separated, yeah, even though know. much of the country want them to remain they separated. They want to say that when it's convenient. Shut but up and dribble, right. those kinds yeah, of yeah. things. Um, but I mean, the, the national anthem itself. Yeah as a political expression, the flyover, you know, before the Super Bowl. That's a political expression. <laughs> Bought and paid for. Bought and paid for. So, you know, in one sense you have a political expression, but those on the other side suppress your political expression. You know, so that's what's happening. There's I noticed you said that you would, in all these instances, for the most part, the coaches always say they had no knowledge beforehand the players were going to do it. And you were saying you want your players to talk to the yeah, teammates yeah. and you first. But you might not have had that opportunity for that to happen. So it just happened, and you're on the sideline. Well, that's a conversation I would have with him after the game. After the game? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we have one more question, though, from uh, Alex Cruz. He said, what would you uh, tell the – what advice would you give to the McCaskey's new football coach? That's a good one. I like it. Uh, is it public? Well, no, we can't say oh, it. Yeah. I don't think it's public yet. Okay. No, it's not. Well, yeah, so yeah, this, well so no, I, it's I, been school board approved, so yeah. So I'll yeah. take this as a general comment to whoever's hired. Well, we can announce it. Mm -hmm. We're no, doing it. Well, uh, I'm not taking part in that. School board approval. Nobody really knows yet. Uh, yeah, that's, what, that's our job. All right. Let's break the news. <laughs> so, go ahead, bro. Uh, All right, break the news. One, one break of, the news, that's, that's, oh. I'm, trying <laughs> right. I'm trying to make it so he doesn't do it. <laughs> um, the best piece of advice I got from a McCaskey coach, uh, and that was Coach Powell. Uh, and he, sa Powell, he said to me after my first year at McCaskey, we went one and nine. No, Penn Manor. Penn Manor. Sorry, well, first year at Penn Manor, we went one and nine. And I, I did a history event that was hosted at the Bird's Nest, you know, his restaurant. And I sat with him at dinner, and he said to me, "Look, no matter what happens, if your if your ship sinks, it's got to sink your way. Meaning, you can't let outsiders, you can't let parents, you can't let administrators, principals, super, any of your program. So if you if if you do it your way, and you just lack competence in that, then you can sleep easy at night." You know, knowing that no one interfered with the sinking of your ship. So it's got to be totally on you. So, you know, whatever whatever the new hire can do to just, you know, put on blinders and not let any distractions from the outside, you know, go and do what he believes in, um, then that's my best piece, piece of advice. I think that's great advice. I can use that outside of sports. Yeah, okay. If you're going to go down, go down your way. Yeah. There's going to be a lot of outside yeah. influence coaching in the cast here. Yeah. And hey, running for school board, I wish I could have did things certain ways that I wanted to do them instead of doing what I thought other people would agree with. Yeah. And I would have felt better. Yeah, I would have felt better losing with my own ideas. Uh, but other than that, Coach, we definitely appreciate you coming out, man. Yeah, I uh, enjoyed Yeah, more questions. Oh, yeah, yeah. You got to come back, man. Gotta, <laughs> yeah, we I don't think we even scratched the surface on a lot of things. Yeah, we definitely, I mean, we definitely got a part two. I mean, this is definitely, uh, I mean, I had a list of, like, Eight, seven questions. Yeah, I might have got the two. No, we still haven't talked about Robert Kraft and LeBron James. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't get to throw you hear Robert Kraft real quick? <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, you can't get Robert Kraft next week. Yeah, I mean. Are you Mike? Yeah, yeah we might be able to get him. More that comes out. Robert's yeah. putting the record as fake crime. Hashtag fake crime. He's, no. still, he's still hiding out in his house. Oh, the out. broadcast was interrupted when you were talking, Coach. What? Uh, they got the last one. Yeah, the, the last, last question, question yeah. Uh, well, uh, I was <laughs> Yeah, listen to the podcast, and listen to the podcast, watch it on YouTube. Yes, yes. It's yes, be posted on YouTube. This, this will be posted on YouTube tomorrow. Um, SoundCloud. SoundCloud, everywhere. So make sure if you if, if uh, you didn't get it, the full interview, you can definitely get it on YouTube tomorrow. And uh, our podcast will be up by Tuesday. So other than that, uh, shout-outs. Give a shout-out as we go around the room. Uh, Dixon. Hey, shout out to you guys. Shout out to Coach for uh, 
Yeah, when we're first starting off high school, instilling in us like the work effort, you know, to hold each other accountable and pushing each other. You know, that's why we're the most winningest class in McCaskey history. <laughs> <laughs> that's a fun truth to this day. Yeah. <laughs> uh, my shout out because it's just relevant to our con most of our conversation today. Uh, Julius Campbell from the movie Remember the Titans, he died a couple weeks ago. Um, yeah, he died a couple weeks ago, that's and we didn't touch on it in, on the show at all, but um, that's one of my favorite movies, and it was just relevant to a lot of the conversation we had today, so I want to shout out Julius Campbell and his family. First shout out ever. I'm going to do one this week. Uh-oh. You know, I don't do shout out. But uh, one of my co-workers, Anthony Montez, one of the firefighters, we had a fire last week, and unfortunately it was his aunt and uncle passed, and uh, shout out to Aunt Tony Montez. We all support you, man. But uh, that's a tough job when you go save somebody, it ends up being uh, your own family. So definitely praying, praying, yeah, praying for him away and and you Hopefully, you're in a better place. Well, you got shout outs right now. You're, uh, uh, deep. <laughs> I never, never give a shout out. <laughs> that's tough, man. <laughs> yeah, I definitely agree. Prayers up for both of them. Uh, Coach Melly, any anybody you want to you want to shout out or oh, me? Um, yes, sir. Yeah, so my my family. So my wife Melissa. Uh, son Carter and uh, one year old daughter Adeline. Awesome. I, I do the same thing. I just say the seven letter family because we're all seven letters. You got to explain um, that this week. <laughs> <laughs> so, shout out to the seven letter family. Shout out to Coach Melody. Uh, this guy, like for those that don't know, been a close friend to me for years, mentor. Uh, I can call him with anything. Uh, you might not like the advice he's going to give you, but it's going to be real. And it just is what it is. So, uh, I appreciate him for coming out, coming on the podcast. I appreciate him for just, you know, being there for me growing up through my adulthood and childhood, actually. So, other than that, everybody good? Everybody good to go? On that, no, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're out of here. Make sure you stay laid up, stay prayed up, stay out the way, and listen to what some old folks have to say. See you guys next week. Peace. Smash your underpants. You did it every week. <laughs> <laughs>